Your speaker is uh, Professor David Tal, who is a visiting professor from uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, he's a visiting professor at the University of Syracuse for this year and next. He is a scholar of um, Israeli and American foreign policy. He's also uh, a scholar of uh, uh, the history of the disarmament project. His last and best known book is uh, about uh, the war of uh, uh, 1948 and Israeli foreign policy. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, first of all, to, uh, for coming. And uh, I would like to thank, from uh, really from the deep of my heart, uh, to the uh, Jewish Studies program that invited me to here, and uh, to uh, Peter, Penny, uh, Bruce, and Mary for the wonderful uh, reception and hospitality. I'm really grateful for that. Thank you so much. And now I am paying my duties. I got so much, so now I am really happy to give something in return. The uh, topic uh, of my talk today will be the creation of the uh, special relationship between Israel and the United States. Now, when we are talking about the creation of this relationship, there is one thing that it is important to emphasize that. The relationship between Israel and the United States, or the need to create this relationship, are restricted mainly to uh, the security dimension. Because on various aspects of the bilateral relations between Israel and the United States, there was almost from the very beginning uh, a great amount of cooperation, of sympathy, of help, mainly on the part of the United States toward Israel. So as far as the relationship in terms of economy, in terms of uh, uh, support in various forums, support in various uh, issues, the way Israel looked at the United States from the very beginning, and I'll talk uh, about that a little bit, there was a great deal of cooperation between Israel and the United States from the very beginning. So it is possible to say, I won't go too deep into that, but it is possible to say that the relationship between Israel and the United States from the very beginning of the establishment of the State of Israel had something special from the very beginning. But the thing was that, as far as Israel was concerned, the Israel aspiration was to uh, uh, have this kind of relationship also as far as the security dimension is concerned. Israel wanted to have special relationship uh, uh, that will be translated into mainly uh, a kind of security commitment on the United States part toward Israel. That was the main goal, the main target, and that will be in the heart of my talk today. And um, the students of uh, United States foreign policy uh, are divided roughly uh, between uh, uh, conservatives and, uh, uh, or traditionalists and revisionists where they are dealing with the United States foreign policy. The traditionalists usually emphasize the ideological aspect of United States foreign policy, while the revisionists emphasize usually the realistic economic aspect of this relationship. And uh, both of uh, uh, students of both schools uh, of thought debated and analyzed United States relations with Israel, but they did that to a great extent from the American point of view. It was an America-centric approach to the study of the United States foreign policy in general and uh, regarding Israel in particular. And what uh, uh, kind of helped to that approach to prevail, the approach that sees the relationship between Israel, uh, United States and Israel in this case, from the American point of view, what helped them was the fact that they relied mainly on American documents. The American archives were the main source for the study of the mutual relationship. And, definitely, and, and, and for sure, when you are looking on the uh, archives of the uh, major state, then your point of view and your attitude in your uh, study and research will be influenced 
by the point of view of Washington. Now, definitely, uh, when we are talking about the relationship between the United States and Israel, it is quite obvious where is the center and where is the periphery. However, the nature of this relationship between Israel and the United States, in this case in particular, but that's true also uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, the relationship between the United States and other countries. It turned out that if we are relying not only on the American documents, and if we are ready to expand our horizons, then we can see that in many cases the periphery also has a very significant part in the, creation ship, uh, in the creation of the relationship between the two states, between the periphery state and between the center of the United States. And this is the approach that I would like to endorse today in my talk. I would like to emphasize the way Israel acted to shape the United States' attitude toward Israel. Now, definitely, the main decisions were taken here in Washington. That was the place where the main decisions were made. And it was the American interests that influenced and shaped the nature of the relationship between the two states. However, the Israeli diplomacy was just as instrumental and influential in the shaping of this relationship. Now, that was possible, first of all, because there was someone receptive in Washington to accept the Israeli uh, engagement in, in diplomacy. But there was also an Israeli active diplomacy aiming to achieve that goal, which I mentioned in the beginning, and that is of creating special relationship in the field of security between Israel and the United States. Now, when we are talking about the creation of this relationship, I will uh, concentrate mainly on the years uh, 1949 until 1963, 1962, 1963, because uh, uh, in 1963, the Kennedy administration decided to provide Israel with uh, uh, Hawk missiles, and that was the first step toward the changing in the attitude of the United States toward uh, 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 security relations with Israel. So, I will uh, uh, describe to you how Israel was instrumental in making a change in the United States foreign policy toward Israel. Now, the, the American attitude to Israel was decided, and here I may, uh, uh, I'm not sure that all those attending uh, uh, this talk today and, and uh, scholars outside this room will agree with me. But my understanding and my, my uh, assumption is that the United States foreign policy is uh, heavily based on ideology. It is an ideological foreign policy. And it is this nature of the United States foreign policy that decided to great extent the nature of the relationship between Israel and the United States. It was the common uh, sense of democracy, of the fact that Israel was a democracy, the fact that Israel was, uh, there was a, a, a religious flavor in the attitude of American presidents to uh, Israel. It was the impact of the Holocaust that was also instrumental in the decision-making process toward Israel and the attitude toward Israel the attitude toward the creation of the State of Israel. And the, the uh, one uh, illustrative point was, for example, the decision of the Truman administration to uh, uh, recognize the State of Israel shortly after the establishment of the State of Israel in May 1948. And there was a huge debate uh, between the State Department that uh, uh, George Marshall, the, the uh, United States um, uh, Secretary of State tried to postpone such a decision, to postpone a recognition, an American recognition in Israel, while the White House, uh, and including uh, President Truman, intended to recognize Israel just shortly after uh, uh, the Israeli proclam uh, proclamation of independence. And during the debate, one of Truman's uh, 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 advisors, uh, Clifford Clark, made several points to justify why the United States should 
recognize Israel. And the points he made are quite uh, uh, typical and quite uh, uh, um, illustrative in the way the United States attitude was shaped toward Israel. And among these points was, just as I said, the fact that Israel was a democracy, even on its very beginning, because the Jewish institutions, even before the establishment of the State of Israel, were based on a democratic system. It was uh, the right of the Jews to national uh, uh, home, to statehood, as was decided by the League of Nations, and later on, of course, by the United Nations in November 1947. So there was a legitimacy that uh, uh, called for recognizing the State of Israel. There was the uh, sympathy of a new state, the United States, in, in, the, in the feeling, the new state toward a new established state that shares values of uh, uh, justice, of democracy, of uh, 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 even uh, he referred to some biblical terms. So the whole notion, and, and Truman accepted, uh, uh, actually, as at least Truman uh, described it, uh, what he wanted uh, to hear from Clifford uh, Clark was not reason to justify Truman's decision, but to be able to say to uh, uh, Marshall, well, he convinced me in, in what was already a decision made by uh, Truman. So Truman decided uh, to vote for or to uh, accept and to recognize the establishment of the State of Israel. Just It was about 15 minutes after uh, the Israeli uh, proclamation was made. And under these circumstances, the Israelis wished to achieve from the United States what they thought was one of the most essential issues that would secure the existence of the State of Israel. Now, the Israeli flirt with the United States had started uh, at about 1949, but the origins of the Israeli uh, 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 um, inclination to see the United States as the state supporting the Zionist cause had started after 1939. In 1939, the British government decided uh, to back off from the Balfour Declaration and from the League of Nations uh, mandate that called for the establishment of a national home for the Jews in Palestine. In 1939, the British withdrew from that decision and it uh, was shortly afterwards that David Ben-Gurion, who was the head of the Jewish agency, that was the uh, de facto uh, Jewish government, uh, and he decided to move uh, to the United States and to start to run the Zionist politics from the United States. In 1942, uh, for example, it was in New York, in Biltmore Hotel, that it was the first time that the Zionists announced publicly their goal, which will be the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. That was the first time that such a statement was made. And it was done in New York, and it was not incident. Now, when David Ben-Gurion moving to New York during the Second World War indicated that David Ben-Gurion thought that from now on the Zionist movement should concentrate and should act in the United States to gain United States support for the Zionist idea. Because the assumption was that just as happened after the First World War, it will be after the Second World War that a new Versailles conference will be uh, uh, convened, new decisions will be made, and during that new conference, the United States will support, that was the hope, the establishment of a Jewish state. Things went differently, but in essence, that was the historical uh, uh, movement. And with the uh, United Nations uh, resolution in 1947 calling for the establishment of a Jewish and Arabic states in Palestine, the road, as I just described, was paved to the American recognition, support and recognition to the idea of partition and to the idea of the establishment of the State of Israel. However, for David Ben-Gurion, and when I'm talking about David Ben-Gurion, I'm emphasizing David Ben-Gurion because he was the founding father, and he was the one who articulated the main concepts of Israel's security conception. And in that, uh, he shared 
his ideas with most of the uh, uh, new government, new Israeli government that was formed in 1948 and onward. David Ben-Gurion's lesson from the 1948 war was that Israel must have strong security ties with a great power. And if you look in the map, you can understand why is that. Tiny Israel with about, uh, at that time it was uh, about 600,000 Jews in, in the new state. The number will be doubled within three, four years, but still we are talking about uh, something like uh, uh, one million, uh, million point four uh, hundred thousand Jews in an area surrounded by uh, nearly 70 million Arabs in the immediate circle and in the wider circle there were much more uh, uh, Islamic who were just as hostile in the eyes of David Ben-Gurion. So for David Ben-Gurion, geography and demography meant that Israel would be under an existential and permanent threat. And Ben-Gurion was sure, with no reason, objectively, but Ben-Gurion was sure, as were the Israelis at the time, that the Arabs just waiting for an opportunity to resume the war against Israel. The Arabs did not uh, accept the results of the 1948 war. They were humiliated. This was what Ben-Gurion thought. They were humiliated, and on the first opportunity, they will launch another war against Israel in order to destroy Israel and to destroy uh, the Jewish community in Israel. And he was convinced about that. Now, as far as we can tell, there were no such intentions on the Arab side. In June 1950, the American ambassador had a talk with the deputy foreign uh, minister of Saudi Arabia. And that deputy foreign minister told the American ambassador, he told him, we don't recognize the state of Israel. We don't acknowledge its existence. However, for us, Israel is a state behind a big wall. It's a kind of irony, but this is what he said. For us, Israel is behind a big wall. We don't want any connection with Israel. We want nothing with Israel. We are not going to fight Israel. Israel is there, is a fact. But Israel will stay, as far as we're concerned, behind a huge wall. So this expression was typical to the, what seems to be the common spread atmosphere among the Arabs against Israel. We won't accept your existence, but we are not going to fight against you. However, the feeling, as I said, in Israel was that uh, a war, an Arab war against Israel was inevitable. It was only a matter of time. And to secure the existence of the state of Israel, it was necessary to rely on the support of a great power. And of course, the natural candidate to fill that role was the United States. It was not only because the United States was the major power, it was because of the kind of natural relationship that developed between Israel and the United States. It was the United States, for example, who assisted Israel in one of the most economic crises that uh, took place in Israel in the beginning of the 1950s, when Israel had hardly uh, enough fuel and enough wheat to run its economy and to feed its population. And the United States assisted Israel to overcome these shortages and these problems. And that was done without second thinking. Or, from another perspective, it was the United States government that made it quite easy for Jewish organizations to donate money and to transfer money from the United States to Israel without all the bureaucracy that usually comes with these kind of enterprises. So, there were special relationships between Israel and the United States. So, the hope was that the United States uh, uh, will be ready to transform or to expand this relationship and to include also the security dimension. And as far as Israel was concerned, this security dimension of the relationship meant, one, supply of arms to Israel, and second, a security pact between Israel and the United States. Both countries will come to the assistance of the other in case of war. The Americans did not really uh, uh, were excited by the prospect of Israel coming to their help in case of war. <laughs> it was more attractive to the Israelis. but. But still, it was a mutual uh, idea. But 
But the United States, the Truman administration response was very clear. No chance. First of all, you don't need it. As far as we can see it, said the Truman administration, the, the State Department, as far as we can see it, there is no intention on the Arab parts to go to war against you. Second, even if there will be a war, the uh, uh, military balance is as such that you will win such a war. You have enough to win and to defeat another Arab attack. And third, if the wars will happen, we are here to help you. And in May 1950, for example, a declaration was issued. It's called a declara the Tripartite Declaration for the Security of the Middle East. And it was signed by uh, France, Great Britain, and the United States. And one commitment uh, in that uh, Tripartite Declaration was that the, the, the uh, signatories will come to the assistance of a state that will be attacked by its neighbors. Ben-Gurion thought that the Tripartite Declaration was a nice idea, but a little bit irrelevant for Israel. Because considering the size of Israel, an attack, the United States will come to assist a now longer existing state. So it was not enough. At a certain point, and that is very character, uh, character, car characteristic, thank you, uh, to uh, Ben-Gurion way of thinking, realizing that the United States will not give Israel the security uh, guarantees it was asking, so Ben-Gurion said something like, well, if you are unwilling to give us the security uh, guarantees, we don't want your security guarantees. I don't want to be a member of a club that won't accept me. That was what Ben-Gurion was saying. But Israel did want this relationship, but it was obvious that it was impossible to achieve. And the truth was that Ben-Gurion knew quite well that the Americans were right in their estimation of the threat that Israel was facing in realistic terms. In realistic terms, Ben-Gurion knew that there was no uh, uh, imminent attack expected against Israel, and Israel has enough uh, uh, military power to defeat any such an attack. So Israel could live for the time being at least, without security guarantees from the United States or from any uh, great power. Britain was ruled out because of the bitter relationship between the two uh, uh, countries, considering their uh, uh, near uh, past. And the third candidate, France, was usually considered to be a pro-Arab. So there was nothing to talk with the France until 1954. In 1954, a rebellion uh, uh, started uh, to take place in Algeria, which was uh, uh, actually a French territory. And that rebellion was assisted by Nasser, by the Egyptian ruler Nasser, and France immediately changed its policy toward the Middle East, assuming that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and since Israel and Egypt uh, were enemies, then Israel became a French ally. And in 1956, or from 1954, and uh, the peak was in 1956, France started to supply Israel with a lot of arms. Arms that uh, gave Israel the feeling, the sense of security it was seeking from the very beginning of its establishment. However, in 1958, a change took place in the Middle East, a change that was the beginning of the changing relationship between Israel and the United States. In 1958, a revolution took place in Iraq, the same Iraq. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like I'm uh, reading the yesterday's newspaper. But there was a revolution, and uh, uh, the pro-Western regime uh, was replaced by what will be an anti-Western uh, uh, regime, but was what, what was more uh, uh, worry for uh, the Americans and the British was the fact that there was a lot of unrest also in Jordan and in Lebanon. And both Kamil Shamoun from Lebanon and King Hussein from Jordan called for a Western assistance against that agitation that started to spread in their countries. And in result, in July 1958, 
The Americans sent Marines to Beirut, assisting Kamil Shamoun to overcome his opponents, and the British sent their troops to Amman to assist King Hussein. Now, if you know the geography of the Middle East, then you know that from Britain, if you want to go directly to Jordan, you have to cross to overfly Israel. And the British Prime Minister Macmillan sent a telegram to David Ben-Gurion asking for permission to overfly Israel. And while Ben-Gurion was reading the telegram, he heard the British plans crossing Israel. So Ben-Gurion's answer was immediately, stop immediately the overflight. Ben-Gurion was worried, but he saw also prospects. He was worried from the Soviet reaction. How the Soviet will react to a British uh, 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 action in the Middle East that way, and Israel involvement in these actions. And he saw also prospects uh, over which I will elaborate in a minute. A methodical brief. Now, the British needed the Israeli pathway. They needed that because they had a very strong uh, feeling of urgency, so they needed that. And immediately, Macmillan sent a message to uh, John Foster Dallas, the uh, American uh, Secretary of State, urging Dallas to ask the Israelis to grant permission for the British overflights. And Dallas sent an urgent telegram to David Ben-Gurion, and David Ben-Gurion said, no problems. Here is our list of demands. <laughs> and in that list of demands were, among other things, a lot of uh, requests for weapons. Now, most of the things that Israel put into that list, mainly the weapons, were aimed to achieve a political goal, not a military goal. It was aimed to create or to open a gap or to open a channel to the United States. As far as the French were selling arms to Israel and were providing Israel security, the feeling in Israel was that the relationship between Israel and France were temporary. They were based on a very concrete event, the events in Algeria, and once the crisis in event would be settled, that will be the end of the honeymoon between Israel and France. So Israel sought, while still engaging with this close relationship with France, Israel was already seeking the alternative. And again, the natural alternative was the United States. So that was the list with uh, uh, fantastic uh, 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 list of um, various military uh, items, tanks and airplanes and uh, you mentioned whatever, but Ben-Gurion knowing that the answer will be no, but he was hoping that at least something, the Americans will feel that, well, we cannot say no to everything, so they will give at least something, and that something will serve as the basis for the next negotiations with the United States. But Eisenhower knew better than that, and uh, Eisenhower out first of all saying to David Ben-Gurion, we will discuss favorably the list, please let the British cross your state. And Ben-Gurion, with this direct uh, approach from Eisenhower, had no choice, but he said yes. But his yes changed the perception, the place of Israel in British and American eyes in the Middle East. Israel was trying to convince mainly the United States since 1951-1952 that the West cannot rely on the Arab states to defend the Middle East against the possible Soviet attack. And that was an issue at that time. That was a topic. And the United States and Britain were trying to create a Middle East uh, a military establishment, which will include also Egypt, among other things, to serve as a base in case of a Soviet attack on the Middle East. Now, the Egyptians declined the British and the American requests to be member in that uh, partnership. And Israel, all the time, in any occasion, uh, Israeli diplomats told American diplomats, the Egyptians will not come to your help. There is no way that the Egyptians or any, Ara any other Arab state will fight with you against the Soviets. 
Israel is the only trustworthy ally of the West in the Middle East. Now, while the United States and Britain acknowledge that there, there was some truth in, in that Israeli saying, still, the balance, the total balance was as such that they preferred still to rely on the Arabs in the defense of the Middle East rather than on Israel. Because it was obvious that if the United States and the, the Britain would start to cooperate militarily with Israel, that means alienating the Arab states. And that didn't make sense. However, after the 1958 crisis, and the Israelis uh, uh, were quite fast in raising that point again and again, the Israelis uh, and the uh, Dallas, who was quite uh, neutral, negative in his attitude to security relations with Israel, even Dallas changed his mind, assuming that indeed Israel was among those states in the Middle East that the West can rely on. Now, that did not mean that the United States would start to sell major arms systems to Israel as Israel demanded. But what the Americans did was asking the British to start to provide major arms systems to Israel. Now, the British had no problem with that, because for the British, arms sales was a political act in the sense that that created allies and that created influence. But it was also a very pure economic transaction. You know, you get weapons and you get paid for that. So, but the Americans did not only ask the British to provide arms to Israel. The Americans also assisted Israel to pay for these arms. So there was a change in the attitude of the United States toward Israel, not a direct change. It was a kind of an indirect change, but there was a very clear message in this change. Now, the Israelis, David Ben-Gurion, realized that that was the most that they can achieve at the time being from the United States in security terms. And after all, Britain started now to supply Israel with all the arms it was uh, needed, so that was no longer a problem. But still, the, the, the main goal, the main strategic goal was establishing security relationship with the United States. That remained the goal. And when Eisenhower ended his term as a president, his second term, and Kennedy uh, came to the White House in uh, 1961, the Israeli renewed their attempts to increase, to deepen the security relations with the United States. Now, one permanent argument that was used by the Americans to reject the Israeli arguments was, well, you got enough from what you need from Great Britain on the one hand. On the second hand, what the Arabs has is you are capable of meeting any Arab challenge with what they have. So the Israelis were quite constantly are following the arm shipments coming from the Soviet Union to the Arab states. The Soviet Union started to sell arms to the Middle East uh, states in 1955. In September 1955, that was the first time that an announcement about arms shipments from the, United, from the Soviet Union to Egypt, in that case, was announced. And that was the beginning of the uh, supply of Soviet arms to Arab states. And that included Egypt, later on Syria, and from 1958, Iraq as well. So from now on, Israel was following very strictly what the Arabs are getting, not only to, you know, you need that for intelligence and to be ready and to be prepared, but it was also a bargain chip. Because every time the Arabs get something that seems to be quite threatening, the Israeli diplomats ran immediately to Washington saying, well, they got now that kind of plan, they got that kind of tank, they got that kind of weapon, and the Americans all the time had to say, well, but you got that from Britain, you got that from Britain, so you are all set. You don't need our arms. And they maintained that refusal. Until at a certain point during 1962, and uh, this is a very peculiar story. In 1961, uh, Nasser decided that Egypt needed ground-to-ground uh, uh, -ground missiles, long-range ground-to-ground missiles. And he initiated uh, a project 
uh, which, uh, uh, in which he called uh, German scientists to come to Egypt and to help Egypt to build these missiles. Now, when the news, when the world spread about this event, Israel, of course, got immediately panicked, at least in the newspaper's headlines. And the Israeli politicians immediately started to pump this thing. Well, you see, Nasser is now planning, with the help of German slash Nazi scientists, to build the tools that will destroy Israel. And there was a huge debate inside Israel about the meaning of that project with, I don't know if you know the name, but he lives forever in the Middle East, Shimon Peres, who was at the time the Israeli um, uh, the, the Secretary of the Ministry of Defense, the General uh, Secretary of the uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, Shimon Peres dismissed the, 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 the meaning of that project while the head of the Israeli Mossad, Isser Harel, uh, was sure that this is a very serious project and Israel must fight with all its power to prevent that project from happening. And, and uh, uh, one thing that Israel did, for example, was sending uh, bomb uh, letters to the families of the German scientists trying to scare them and to make them stop their involvement in that project. Now, that project was, after all, a hoax. It was nothing. But it was enough, together with other Soviet shipments, it was enough to bring Israel to Washington saying, well, we need at least ground-to-air missiles that will help us to defend against the new acquisition of planes coming from the Soviet Union to Egypt. And from maybe in the past, in the future, uh, from these ground-to-ground -ground missiles. And for the Kennedy administration, that was a real problem. Because all in all, the uh, conclusion in Washington was that the Israelis were right. There was a real threat to the Israeli uh, territory by the Egyptian plans. And who knows what will happen with these ground-to-ground -ground missiles. So Kennedy decided that as an exception, and it should not be considered as a rule, and it was not an opening to something. As an exception, the United States will sell Israel the Hawk missiles. Now, at that time, it's not that Israel did not need the Hawk missiles, but Israel did not need the Hawk missiles. <laughs> there was a huge debate between the military, between the army and the government. The, um, the, uh, uh, the commander of the Israeli Air Force, Ezra Weizmann, told uh, David Ben-Gurion, he told him, I don't need these missiles. We can defeat any Arab challenge. We don't need these missiles. With the money that you're going to spend on these missiles, give me the money, I have more useful uh, uh, things to buy. But the purpose of the purchase was not military, or not only military. The real purpose was political. The goal was to make one significant purchase of major military system from the United States. Because the assumption was that once there will be a crack in the wall, it will be no longer possible to stop that crack. And the most obvious sign to the political nature of the transaction was the fact that when Britain heard about the Israeli request, the Britain came immediately to Israel saying, we have this missile. <laughs> Come to buy it from us. Now, in the, past, in the past, Israel asked for these missiles from Britain, but Britain said, well, we can't give it to you because the Americans don't let us send selling it to you. But when the British heard that the Americans are going to sell this missile, they said, we can send it to you. But Israel said, well, thank you. Because the purpose of the missiles essentially was political. And for what was for Kennedy, a real exception was for Israel the first act that will lead eventually to the kind of collapse of the American policy of refusing to sell major arms sales to Israel. And with that, of course, to come into a kind of at least a de facto security guarantee to Israel. 
And history shows that the Israeli calculation was true. So with that arms transaction, which was announced in uh, 1963, it was one of the last things that, been, uh, that Kennedy did before uh, uh, getting shot, was his decision to sell these uh, um, uh, Hawk missiles that was indeed eventually the beginning and the real beginning of a changing nature of the Israeli-American relations in the security field. Now, to conclude, it is, I can't say that it was the Israeli diplomacy that led to a change in the American foreign policy. The United States changed its policy because it assumed that it was necessary to make these changes. However, the great achievement of the Israeli foreign policy was the fact that Israel knew with what kind of arguments to come and to show the administration that the Israeli demands were well grounded. Now, the Kennedy uh, understood very well the political dimension of the Israeli request, but nevertheless, the assumption of the Americans was, in that case, that there was a real need. So, that was eventually the selling of the Hawks was a triumph for the Israeli diplomacy and in a way a triumph to the Israeli uh, uh, approach calling for the establishment of special relationship between Israel and the United States, not only in economic and in, 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 uh, social aspects and, and any other aspects, but also what was considered in Israeli eyes the most important thing and that was the security dimension. Thank you. Professor Dahl will be uh, willing uh, to answer questions. If not the Hawk missiles in 1963, would it have been some other missile in 64, 65? Was it inevitable, or do you think it, um, that particular point in time was so crucial that it happened there? Uh, as you said, it is not the Hawk uh, that, uh, that uh, it, there is always, in the Middle East, there is always a crucial moment. There is always a crucial time. So it was not 1962, 1963, it would be 1964. In that, in that regard, Israel had a quite a space because it got arms still from France, it got arms from uh, Britain. But uh, the, the most important thing, I think, it was a kind of the United States understood and sympathized with the Israeli cause, after all. And the United States' reluctance to provide major arms systems was not a matter of principle. It was a matter of uh, what the United States assumed was the real necessary policy for the United States. But essentially, after all, the Americans were sympathizing with the Israeli requests. They kind of reluctantly did not accept the Israeli requests. So once the opportunity came, the United States was ready and willing to provide these arms. And Johnson did that much more willingly. And two questions. One. You said nothing about 1956. Uh, two, how come that it was the Soviet Union which was the first to recognize the state of Israel? Uh, well, I didn't mention the 1956 uh, because uh, you were uh, pushing me to speak only 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that within that time frame, uh, the, the real meaning of, of not talking about the 1956 war was the fact that there was a kind of a clash between Israel and the United States, but that clash was uh, over a specific issue, and that it was resolved in March 1957. So it was not a real issue between the two states, and hence it didn't really, it was not a real uh, uh, element in the process I was describing. And I, 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 I prefer to emphasize and to concentrate on the road, on the path, on the big road. Now, uh, the fact, I, I think that uh, in a way, the fact that the, the Soviet Union was the first to uh, recognize Israel, uh, there are two dimensions to your question. One is the technical dimension, and the second is the ideological dimension. Now, from the technical point of view, I guess that it is a matter of technicality. That, I don't know, they were first on the line. The Israeli switchboard was busy, and they were the first on the line. But on a more profound issue, uh, the question, why did the Soviet Union acknowledge, and, and the United, the, it was the Soviet Union vote in uh, November 1947 that eventually allowed 
the uh, resolution in the United Nations that called for the establishment of the State of Israel. Now, the assumption is that uh, the Soviet Union did that because uh, not, uh, uh, first of all, because they thought that the Jews deserve state. But second, because it would uh, 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 remove the British from at least one bastion in the Middle East. That was the beginning of the British uh, withdrawal from the Middle East. And the British were the dominant power in the Middle East since the uh, 19th century. So that was one step toward the uh, 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 removal of the British from the Middle East. And the uh, Soviet Union uh, acknowledged the state of Israel with the hope, so uh, it is assumed, that there were, uh, within the Israel political system, there were also uh, uh, left-wing elements and communist elements. And the assumption was that the, British, uh, the Soviets hoped to strengthen these elements inside Israel and to bring Israel into the Soviet camp. And Israel may became the first. The Soviet Union, until 1955, had no footstep in the Middle East. The Middle East was completely under Western control. And not only Western, it was under British control. So it was assumed that the uh, Soviet support of the, uh, it was not only the vote uh, and the uh, Soviet uh, recognition, it was also the arms sales, for example. Czechoslovakia provided Israel arms during, uh, since uh, March, April 1948, in what was a very crucial stage in Israel war of independence. And it was under the Soviet agreement that the Czech provided these arms. So the assumption is that the Soviets really hope that that will open a gate to the Soviet Union, to the Middle East, through Israel. Did um, Kennedy have any personal relationship with Ben-Gurion? Or what was, his, what was the nature of that relationship? Well. It was not uh, a laugh from the first sight, let me promise you that. I mean, uh, at that time, uh, as, as much as it will uh, sound strange, at that time, Israeli prime ministers did not really see presidents, American presidents, as often as they see them today. You know, today, uh, Israeli prime minister is a visitor in the guest house. He's coming to the guest house. He's saying hi to everybody. It's, it's a very uh, frequent visitor. At that time, there was only one meeting between Kennedy and Ben-Gurion. And, uh, and uh, as far as I can tell, there were no special relationship on a personal basis between the two. Uh, Ben-Gurion was uh, uh, quite old. He was in his 70s at that time. And uh, Kennedy was young. Uh, the temper, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the, regretfully, I am on this side of the scale, so. Um, so uh, the, the, the relation, but on the other side, uh, uh, and, and, ben and Kennedy, for example, uh, at a certain point sent uh, very threatening letters to David Ben-Gurion in the middle of 1963 because of the uh, nuclear project, the Israeli nuclear project. But all in all, Kennedy was no exception in his attitude toward Israel, which was a profound sympathy to the cares of Israel. And, and it was that sentiment, that assumption, that evaluation of Israel that uh, uh, in, in, in a way uh, uh, directed Kennedy's foreign policy as it directed Eisenhower's and Truman's and later on Johnson's. Well, I think it's time to say thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank him for being here and in some ways also to uh, celebrate the anniversary of Israeli independence, which uh, takes place, uh, begins this evening. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the people who support Jewish studies, uh, especially the Gold Foundation, which uh, has made it possible for us to videotape this event, and we hope uh, it will be shown on UCTV. Uh, Jewish Studies uh, regularly offers such programs, uh, and uh, this Friday, James Young will speak on Berlin's Holocaust Memorial Problem and Mine at 9.30 in the morning in Humanities 206. Next Monday, Harry Broad will speak here at 5 o'clock on the people of the comic book.
It's a man. It's a Jew. It's a supermensch. Uh, I hope you'll join us at some of these events. Uh, and uh, I invite you to come and talk with David Tal personally and to help us uh, festively celebrate Israeli Independence Day. Thank you. <laughs>